screen go away so I can get it on to showing. Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much, especially on this lovely evening, to stay indoors and listen to the story of King James V, and especially his uh, associations with Linlithgow. On April the 10th in the year 1512, a newborn baby's cry echoed over the waters of Linlithgow Loch. They emanated from the Queen's chamber in Linlithgow Palace. It was a boy, the fourth child that Queen Margaret had produced, but the only one to survive longer than 10 months. The royal baby was christened James the very next day, Easter Sunday, on the grounds that an unbaptized child could not enter the kingdom of heaven. As the royal chapel was not yet finished, the baptism took place in St. Michael's Church. As a young girl, James's mother had been dynastic dynamite. As the daughter of King Henry VII and the sister of Henry VIII, her arranged marriage to any of Europe's ruling monarchs would have been a profitable arrangement for the English crown. But it was decided that she should marry the Scottish king, James IV, thus heralding a truce between the two nations. Turning, somebody's not muted. Can you mute yourself if it hasn't done so? Spurning other suitors, Margaret's wedding took place in August 1503, the 13-year-old English princess marrying the 30-year-old Scottish king at the marriage of the thistle and the rose. It was a union, however, not consummated until the Scottish Queen was 16 years old. Along with the betrothal came a treaty of perpetual peace. I write. It was signed whereby Scotland and England agreed to end the centuries-old intermittent warfare. And for a short while, relations did improve. But tensions continued between the ambitious, headstrong Scottish king and the irascible Henry VIII, who came to the throne in 1509. Margaret was generously treated by her husband, who in addition to all the trappings and retinue required by a queen, endowed her with the castles at Methven, Doon, Stirling, and of course Linlithgow Palace, her favourite place of residence, in which she gave birth to her son, James, who was just 17 months old when, on September 9th, 1513, his father was killed along with 10,000 Scots on Flodden Field. Included among the slain were many of the principal Scottish nobles, leaving the nation dreadfully short of experienced leaders. Under the terms of James IV's will, his 23-year-old wife became the tutrix and governor for her infant son. And Margaret interpreted this to mean that she was in fact the regent, with complete power to rule the nation. One of her first acts was to order the Linlithgow defences to be improved, ready to face an invasion by the English army. Consequently, the makeshift Yairdheads, the retaining walls at the rear of high street properties, they were built up and reinforced into the strong town defences while guards were permanently placed on the entrance gateways at the West Port, the Low Port and the High Port. Margaret's self-appointed position was challenged by John Stuart, Duke of Albany, who asserted that as a prince of the blood, albeit an illegitimate one, he should be governor of the realm. Albany favoured closer links with France, where he had been brought up. And in this, he was supported by the powerful James Beaton, Archbishop of Glasgow. He feared that the Queen's English nationality would sway her towards supporting the old enemy. However, rivalries amongst other ruling households led the Scottish Parliament, the Estates, to support Margaret's position. And she was duly proclaimed regent at the same time as her son was crowned in the Chapel Royal at Stirling Castle, the fortress, of course, being safely further from the English border than Linlithgow. The shadow of Flodden still hung in the air at what came to be called the Mourning Coronation, and everyone knew that trouble lay ahead. After over 20 years of comparative stability, Scotland now faced a long minority, 
while this was not an unusual occurrence in Scottish history, James V's minority would provide ample cause for many to refer to that passage from Ecclesiastes quoted in many a church pulpit that day, woe to you, O land, when your king is a child. To support the Queen Regent, a team of nobles was appointed, including the Earls of Huntley, Lennox, Morton, Argyle, and one named Archibald Douglas, sixth Earl of Angus, leaving her infant son, the 17-month-old King of Scots, at Stirling, Margaret rode to Edinburgh to meet with her chosen council, and on the way she passed through Linlithgow. What she must have seen could not have been very pleasing to her. Scotland was bankrupt, the coffers empty, depleted by the activities and wars of James IV. Nothing had been done to repair the main thoroughfares. Nothing new there then. The thoroughfares were rutted surfaces in the summer, quagmires in the wetter months. Coming in from the West Port, she would have passed the bridle track to Bathgate via the lands of Preston, that is, the priest's tune on her left. I'm uh, sorry, on her right. On her left, the burial ground and dilapidated chapel of St Ninian standing where St Ninian's Road starts today, passing the large townhouse of James Hamilton of Westport with its adjoining servants' quarters, her carriage would have splashed across the Duck Burn, a sewage-polluted stream which ran across the roadway where Cabrelli's was situated and into the loch. Despite trying, the borough authorities had failed to stop local residents from gutting herring in the stream or using it to carry household effluent and slops into the water. The Queen's conveyance would stick closely to the raised centre of the roadway, the croon of the cosy, where there was slightly less filth, the coachman listening out intently for cries of Gardy Lou. There had been no time to clear away Linlithgow's mitten heaps, as usually happened before a royal visit, and so animal excrement was everywhere deposited by the beasts, kept in most back rigs, and driven down to the loch to drink via the water yet. The King's High Street continued past the communal bleaching green, where the Venal Flats now stand, up the Cross Bray, through the Market Cross, towards the East High Port and the highway to Edinburgh. There were no wines radiating off from the main road, although a gap had been created where the house of Thomas Hamilton, a priest living in Cooper, had collapsed, creating a shortcut to a postern in the town wall at the top of what is now Dogwell Wine. A few larger properties did exist around this point, including the town residences of John Hamilton, Archbishop of St Andrews, the mansion of the Drummonds of Hawthorne Den, their yellow lime-washed tenement nicknamed the Canary Islands, and the home of Robert Cairn Cross, later to be appointed James V's Lord High Treasurer. His house on Cross Bray projected into the road so much that only one carriage could pass on the roadway at a time. The largest mansion, standing in a sizable estate to the south of what is now Dogwell Wind, belonged to James Hamilton, Earl of Arran. He had just created a large orchard importing a rich loam six feet deep into which his gardeners planted fruit trees. Some idea of his wealth can be gleaned from his steward, Gavin Henderson's household papers. Gavin Henderson's entry records, for example, the purchase of provisions for one Friday, which included 200 herring, 84 haddock, 24 trout, 60 perch, 200 eggs, and eight pounds of butter. In addition, local baker James Hamilton was ordered to deliver 187 loaves and 25 gallons of beer to the Earl's residence. Whiskey was not in evidence, regarded as a rough and ready poor man's libation. A survey of 16th century eating habits, including Linlithgow, has revealed that the average the urban elite spent 60% of their household on beer and 29% of their budget on wine. They also ate more fresh meat than the labouring class, 
who tended to survive on oatmeal, wild fowl, fish, and eels caught in the loch. Rabbit was also consumed, and wild fruit and berries, and that actually made their diet better than that of the upper class. An investigation into 16th century skeletons, including some excavated in Linlithgow's Carmelite graveyard, now in the grounds of Nether Parkley, and some skeletons dug up in the Kirkgate, reveal evidence of vitamin and iron deficiency. Interestingly, medical historians put this down to a diet of too much fish and, interestingly, prolonged breastfeeding, often up until the baby was over two years old. The average height of the adult skeletons uncovered was five foot five for men and five foot one for women. But back on the cross bray stood the abode of Don Pedro de Ayala. He had been sent to England to arrange the marriage of James IV and Margaret, and his white fronted tenement, at least the one shown here, is a later building, but still called locally the Spanish Ambassador's House. Further down the high street were the residences of James Douglas, a Glasgow merchant who owned 11 properties in the borough, and on the right, the substantial townhouse of the Cornwalls of Bonnard, one of whom, John Cornwall, had been killed at Flodden. It's now beside the old Royal Bank. Their property bore the family crest of a crow, building a nest atop a wall, and the motto, we build, you see, warily. Their family crest was a play on the name, depicting this crow building a nest of corn. This 18th century sketch, that is, shows that that plaque is missing from the middle of the 1527 tablet at the front of the house. Some years back, a workman thought he had discovered that missing plaque and proudly showed it to me. And there it is, of course, the crow building its nest of corn on a wall, uh, but not so, I'm afraid. It's a fire insurance plaque for the Phoenix Fire Insurance Company. The other dwellings within the town wall were much simpler, many just hovels built of wattle and daub with roofs of straw or turf which had been plundered from the borough moor. The smell from their peat fire dug from the leech loch at Bog Hall or coal from the open cast source at Bonnyton permeated the air. Less well-off residents burned dried whin which had its own odour. And so Regent Margaret completed her journey through her royal borough at the East High Port, which stood to the south of the Middle Raw, a triangular area of land on which stood the burial ground and chapel of the Blessed Virgin Mary. The brass plaques in the doorway you can see on the left show the situation of the Low and the High Port, or where they stood. Sadly, an information plaque stating this has vanished from the wall of the Star and Garter. Margaret exited through the right gateway and that was removed in the late 18th century. She then had to spend several bone jarring hours trundling over the dirt track towards the capital, nor was there much progress visible in the countryside through which she passed. The same farming practices which had existed in biblical times were still in operation with the arable land divided into rigs, measuring a chain wide, 22 yards, by a furlong to 20 yards in length, the strips separated by wasteful box. Each peasant farmer or cotter received several rigs which were reallocated annually, giving no incentive to improve. Crop return was minimal, an average of three to one, a yield which meant perpetual subsistence farming, with one third of the grain going in rent, one third used to provide basic foodstuff, oat cakes, barley beer, and one third kept to sow the next year. As the old rhyme shown here had it, ain't to saw, ain't to gnaw, and ain't to pie the laird with all. In addition, the agricultural labourers were obliged to work for so many days each year on their landlord's farm. Obligations called arage, carriage and bonnage, that is, helping to plough, harvest and transport their master's grain. Farming techniques were primitive, such as a single coulter plough 
sickles or scythes, and a threshing flail. The larger farms might have a circular threshing barn, inside of which an animal would pull a heavy stone-encrusted sledge over the cut grain to separate the seeds from the chaff. From Linlithgow to Edinburgh, the countryside was largely devoid of trees or bushes. They would offer accommodation for plundering birds. The only fenced areas around Linlithgow were the King's Park on both sides of the loch, part of which is now Parkhead Farm, and King Cable, the estate belonging then to the Whitehead family, now Park Farm. Lack of hedges meant that cattle grazing on common moorland could escape the attentions of a young herd boy and stray into a rig and consume what was growing there. Lack of winter fodder meant that many cattle and sheep were killed in late September at Martinmas. The meat from these September marts was salted and preserved to last the winter months. The bits of a sheep that would not keep, the lungs, liver, heart and intestines, were mixed with salt and oatmeal, boiled in the sheep's stomach and eaten as haggis. On her nighttime arrival at Holyrood House, Queen Margaret met with some of her nobles, who were already suggesting suitable candidates for the 25-year-old widow's remarriage. They included Louis XII of France and Maximilian, the Holy Roman Emperor. However, she herself was impressed by one of her own Scottish courtiers, that one we met before, remember? Archibald Douglas, Earl of Angus. His powerful presence and commanding actions she came to appreciate as it added strength to her precarious position as a young female English ruler. The relationship grew and less than a year after her husband's death, Margaret married the 24-year-old Earl, described by influential cleric Gavin Dunbar as, quote, a young witless fool. Certainly his signature seen here below that of Margaret's, it leaves something to be desired. The match horrified many other nobles who were convinced that the ambitious Earl wished to make himself Regent of Scotland, as stepfather to the young James. Consequently, the Islay Herald, Henry Thompson of Kilour, was sent to France to meet with King Louis XII and ask his permission for the Duke of Albany to leave the French court and returned to Scotland as its legitimate regent. Angry at this, Margaret removed herself from the capital and went to live in Linlithgow Palace, where she got the news that the Duke of Albany had indeed returned, landing at Dumbarton with a squadron of eight ships. While in Linlithgow, her nobles presented her with a document written by James IV before he died, declaring that his widow would have to forfeit all her regal positions if she remarried, and that was duly enforced. Margaret appealed to her brother, King Henry VIII, to send an army to restore her position, and this inflamed the Scottish nobles even more, forcing Margaret to flee to England, leaving her three-year-old son, James, in the hands of a succession of governors. A month later, she bore to the Earl of Angus, a daughter, Margaret. She afterwards became Countess of Lennox and was mother of Henry Stuart, Lord Darnley, who was ultimately, you know, to marry Margaret Tudor's granddaughter, Mary Queen of Scots. Don't miss next month's thrilling episode. As can be imagined, given the unusual circumstances surrounding the early years of the young James, his education was a perfunctory and often disrupted. Scholars such as Sir David Lindsay of the Mount, John Bellenden and William Stewart tried to teach the child Latin, history, religion, but the young James was much more interested in the rules of chivalry. He also liked riding, shooting, archery and sword play. He asked and got for his 13th birthday a proper adult sword. James often tried to escape from his academic tutors to seek out more uh, amusing company in the form of a castle servant or usher. And it was they who taught him music, dancing and singing. The court composer, 
Thomas Wood. I know it's spelt W-O-D-E, but I'm told it's pronounced Wood. He wrote the monarch had, and I quote, shown below, in singular good ear, and could sing music he had ne'er seen afore. During his residence in Lanuthco Palace, James played tennis on the court, which was situated where the palace cottage, the, the Peely's house, now stands. He also took part in mock jousting and running at the ring on the peel. We know that one of his teachers, William Stewart, felt that the boy monarch could be a, a handful. He often, William Stewart that is, counselled against irresponsible behaviour, writing after one escapade, two princes is in vice to ride or run or recklessly, or to venture to go on ice, accordus nocht, thy majesty. While James grew up in various royal residences, his regents ruled the nation according to their wishes. Albany, for example, negotiated the Treaty of Rouen, which stipulated that James would marry one of the King of France's daughters. It was ratified in 1522 in Rouen Cathedral, but many Scots were very wary at this pro-French approach, and sensing antagonism, Albany went back to France in 1524. Margaret returned as regent, but she struggled to retain control. Her marriage to Angus had collapsed in acrimony, and she was still seeking a divorce, accusing him of living with another woman while still spending her wealth. Several rival nobles all bid to become regent, and Scotland was left in an unruly state. Two episodes illustrate the feuding that was going on. The first was a skirmish later called Cleanse the Causeway. It took place in Edinburgh in the Lower High Street and concerned two rival families, the Hamiltons and the Douglases. Sir Patrick Hamilton of King Cable an estate just outside Linlithgow, and the Earl of Angus clashed over an attempt by the Hamiltons to have the Earl arrested. The two rivals and their followers swaggered from different ends of the high street, and when they met, both sides claimed the right to walk down the centre of the street. You remember the croon of the cosy. An armed brawl ensued, during which Sir Patrick Hamilton and 70 followers were killed. In the aftermath, many others loyal to the Hamilton cause were attacked in their houses, with an eventual death toll put at 300. The Earl of Angus sent out trumpeters to issue an ultimatum to the remaining Hamiltons to leave the city, and over 800 of them took advantage of this, leaving the Douglases in complete control. The second incident involved Linlithgow Palace which being unoccupied in the year 1521, was taken over by a band of fugitives from justice. Led by Lucas Stirling of Keir, the outlaws sought revenge, sorry, sought refuge in the vacant royal residence and prepared for a siege. Stirling had vied with William Meldrum of the Bins over the affections of an Edinburgh widow. And when this lady chose Meldrum, Stirling challenged him not just to a duel, but to a mass battle at Bonington, and the result was a considerable casualty list and the death of Meldrum. To escape the law, Stirling and his men headed for Linlithgow. The acting governor, appointed by Albany, rejoicing in the name of Sir Anthony Darcy de la Bastie, also known as the White Knight, pursued the fugitives who, after a lengthy siege, eventually surrendered. Such was the unruly state of the Scottish nation. Margaret's time as regent ended in 1526, when a scheme was devised whereby custody of James would rotate between four factions every three months. This arrangement failed when Angus had custody of the king, and unsurprisingly refused to hand him over to the next keeper. James was furious when Angus, who had made himself Chancellor of Scotland, virtually kept James a prisoner for two years, preventing him from seeing his mother and giving his Douglas relatives appointments in the royal household. To appease his young captive, Angus dressed him in fine clothes and indulged his every impulse, 
introducing him to many um, inappropriate pleasures. It is said that Angus deliberately encouraged James from the age of 15 to have amorous adventures, this in order to distract him from exercising political power. James's first illegitimate child, but where, as you see, others, his first was born when he was 17. At least eight more followed. Notwithstanding the lavish treatment of the young James, he was becoming increasingly aware of the political situation and expressing a wish to rule in his own right. In an attempt to overcome the Douglas domination, a force of some 5,000 armed men arrived in Linlithgow in January 1526. However, on the appearance of Angus with an equally large force, the rebels lost their nerve and fled. That night, the peal echoed to the sound of much rejoicing and merrymaking, copious drinking and much horseplay, literally horseplay, as an entry in the Exchequer Rolls records that, quote, the king drowned a horse by submerging him in the loch. Another attempt to release the king occurred in September 1526. At the beginning of the month, on hearing the news that there was a plan to take possession of the boy king, the Earl of Arran, in support of the Douglas cause, began to prepare defences along the River Avon, including artillery pieces brought up from Blackness Castle. All this was in expectation of the arrival from Stirling of the Queen's army, led by the Earl of Lennox, to rescue King James. On the night of 3rd September, Arran left a force of some 200 soldiers guarding the bridge over the Avon, while the rest of his two and a half thousand strong army camped on the Peel. Lennox's army, approaching from Stirling, slept around Haining Castle, the building on the right now standing forlornly in the wasteland that was once Steen's brickworks. The next morning, this force of some 10,000 men marched towards Linlithgow Bridge. Finding the river crossing heavily guarded, William Cunningham, the master of Kilmore's, led his 2,000 horsemen to a ford next to the manual nunnery, whose nuns made themselves scarce and awaited the arrival of the many wounded they knew would soon be coming. The horsemen found themselves trapped in a marshy bottleneck and fired upon by Aaron's army positioned along the high ground of Pace Hill. The infantry, led by Lennox himself, forded the river, but they too found themselves in difficult terrain and fell victim to harquebus shot and a rain of arrows. However, the remaining troops pressed on and engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Things were pretty evenly matched, but what swung the result was the belated arrival of the Earl of Angus along with his force of 3,000 men who rushed into action with the cry of, A Douglas! The result was slaughter. No accurate figures of the dead and wounded exist. The historian Pitt Scotty just makes mention of money slain on both sides, and in special, the Earl of Lennox. Total death toll was probably around 3,000, many of whom were lost in the river or the nearby bog. When the railway viaduct was being built in the 1840s, several skeletons were found, along with a 16th century sword bearing the inscribed legend, Pono leges virtuti, I maintain the laws by valour. Sadly, its whereabouts are now unknown, but on show in the Glasgow International Exhibition in 1888, it was listed as on loan from the Linlithgow Town Council. The king, being guarded in the Nuthco Palace, received the news that his captor had won the day. James immediately ordered Sir Andrew Wood of Largo, his trusted and elderly admiral, to ride hard to the battlefield to try to save as many of the rebels as he could. Wood arrived to find the Earl of Arran standing over the dead body of the 31-year-old Earl of Lennox and declaring the stoutest man the hardiest man that ever was bred in Scotland was slain today. It was said that Lennox had surrendered, but was then brutally murdered by James Hamilton of Finnert. The location of Lennox's murder was commemorated by a cairn 
and after the building of the new Kettleson estate, this has been recreated at the entrance to the, the path leading to Excite. Angus took revenge on many of those that he called rebels, imprisoning some in Blackness Castle, taking over their land and residences, and forcing all to swear allegiance to him. Letters came to light, revealing that the young king had been involved in the uprising, and so he was taken to the secure Angus stronghold of Tuntallan Castle. It was not until 1528 that, helped by a sympathetic custodian, the king managed to escape and rode to Linlithgow, where he met his mother and her loyal lairds. After prayers in the royal chapel, they all marched to Edinburgh with the young king at their head. One of the first acts performed by the 16-year-old monarch showed that he had developed a ruthless, stubborn streak. This is perhaps not surprising, given the events he had witnessed in his youth. James ordered that all the lands belonging to Archibald Douglas were forfeited, and he commanded his stepfather to go into exile. Instead, the Earl of Angus barricaded himself inside Tintalan Castle, where he managed to fight off several attempts to dislodge him. However, the writing was on the wall, and so under cover of darkness, he escaped to Coldingham Priory, and then throwing himself on the mercy of Henry VIII, fled to England, where in return for a pension, he swore an oath of allegiance to the English monarch. What a lovely man. Those who had sided with the Douglas cause forfeited their lands, but the worst punishment befell Archibald Douglas's sister, Janet, Lady Glams. Her lands too were confiscated, but later, following a trumped up charge of using witchcraft to poison the king, she was found guilty and burnt at the stake on the Castle Hill in Edinburgh. James continued to rule with some panache, crushing insurrection in the borders and the highlands, making peace with England and with France. In recognition of his relations with these nations, he was awarded the Order of the Garter from Henry VIII, the Order of St. Michael from King Francis I, and later, when there was talk of him marrying Mary, Queen of Hungary, the sister of Emperor Charles V, he was also awarded the Order of the Golden Fleece. He was later to have the insignia of these honours, along with the Scottish Order of the Thistle, carved on his new entrance to Linlithgow Palace. The Kirk Gate replaced the original route that led from the cross through what is now Market Lane onto the Peel and over a drawbridge, above which was the coat of arms of King James's great-great-grandfather, King James I. The question quickly arose as to who the Scottish monarch should marry, and so James summoned his privy councillors and several foreign diplomats to Linlithgow Palace, and in the great lion chamber they discussed the matter. It was decided that to keep faith in the old alliance with France, James should marry a French noblewoman. The daughters of King Francis, Madeleine and Charlotte, were too young, and so James was urged to consider Mary of Bourbon, the daughter of the influential Duke de Vendôme. Against all advice, James insisted on travelling to France in person to view his prospective bride. And so in September 1536, accompanied by six ships and 500 men, the king set sail from Blackness. The lead ship was the Mary Willoughby, which had been recently captured from the English, uh, a sign perhaps that relationships with the old enemy were breaking down. Landing at Dieppe, James travelled to Paris, where he went on a shopping spree, disguised as a French Monseigneur, although the ruse fooled no one, and many shopkeepers whispered as he passed, voila le roi d'Ecosse. Amongst other purchases, we know he bought 55 tournament spears, a huge diamond worth 9,000 francs, then, and four fine white feathers to adorn his bonnet. He then went on to spy on Marie de Bourbon in her family residence near Tours. James once again donned a disguise, but again he fooled no one, as Marie easily picked him out on account of his clothes, his unusual red hair, and his abysmal French accent. <laughs> 
this urge to a travel about incognito was to be a common feature of James's reign. Sadly, Marie did not pass muster. James was singularly unimpressed by her. So he travelled to Amboise and turned his attention to Madeleine, the 16-year-old daughter of King Francis. The French ruler was initially unwilling, declaring that Madeleine did not keep the best of health and that the notorious climate of Scotland would not help. However, the French king was won over and James and Madeleine were married in Notre Dame Cathedral, where James wore a crimson velvet outfit with a scarlet lining, decorated with 116 22 carat gold buttons. The Roman Catholic marriage was blessed by Pope Paul III, who sent the symbolic blessed sword and hat and declared James as a defender of the faith. And religion, of course, played a large part in the reign of James V. The Catholic Church was increasingly coming under attack with accusations of corruption, greed, carelessness in religious practices, and sometimes immorality, including breaches of celibacy. More and more were questioning the power of the church, especially since they were increasingly educated, thanks to a series of laws passed by James V's father, stating that all sons of landowners should be taught to read. That and the growth of printing, in English or Scots, led to many reading scripture on their own, thinking for themselves and questioning the influence and wealth of the church. Increasingly, in the Linlithgow records, we find members of the various trade crafts expressing their displeasure at the enormous wealth of St Michael's Church. Some trade guilds refused to pay the obligatory fees towards maintaining their allocated altar and for a priest to say mass there daily. The shoemakers complained that their allocated priest often slept in and missed the early morning mass. The tanners objected to being asked to repair the window above their altar, and the smiths blocked up their window in order to avoid having to repair it. When St Michael's church officials forced the rector of the town's grammar school to resign on account of his pupils not attending choral services during school hours, the domine retorted that the boys were, quote, better off in school instead of sitting on the cold stains of the kirk. King James was aware of the criticism of church practices, but for several reasons chose to ignore it. He was, of course, receiving money from Scottish Catholics. He was receiving money from the Roman Catholic Church in France and from the Vatican. He had no desire to follow his uncle's breakaway from the Roman Catholic faith, despite Henry VIII's exhortations. Consequently, James was prepared to punish any heretic who dared voice their criticisms, notably in the case of Patrick Hamilton of King's Cable. As a youngster staying in his family's high street residence, Hamilton Lands, he had been educated at Linlithgow Grammar School. In later life, Patrick's outspoken criticism of the church led to him being arrested and found guilty of heresy. He was burned at the stake in St Andrews in a rainstorm, which so delayed the burning it took six hours for him to die. Another Linlithgow martyr was Henry Forrest, the son of Thomas Forrest of the Cross, later the Cunsey Nuke pub. Henry, who became a Benedictine monk, spoke out in support of Patrick Hamilton, and that was enough to have him tried and sentenced to death. John Lindsay, Archbishop Beaton's advisor, remarked that Forrest should be burned in secret as, quote, the smoke of Maester Patrick Hamilton hath infected all on whom it blew. James often administered his own justice from the Great Hall in Linlithgow Palace, sitting in judgment on such cases as that of Sir Archibald Lyon, found guilty of the murder of a kinsman. King James, using the Scottish legal term of a scythement, that is, recompense for a crime, fined the Linlithgow Knight 5,000 merks to be paid into the king's coffers, for James was always short of money and he needed cash. For example, to further his ambitious plans for the restoration and betterment of his royal palaces. 
in preparation for bringing his new wife, Madeline, back to Scotland, he had ordered extensive improvements at Linlithgow Palace, including installing stained glass in the Gothic windows of the chapel. Sadly, Madeline was never to visit her dower house, as she died just two months after her arrival and was buried in Holyrood Abbey. Hastily, James made preparation for another French betrothal and plumped for Marie of Guise, a marriage that would beneficially ally him with the powerful Catholic house. Shortly after her arrival from France, he brought her to Linlithgow where she was mightily impressed by the royal building, which had recently been improved by master mason Thomas French. Marie called it, in French of course, as fine as any chateau in France. Further additions were made throughout James's reign, and the monarch often visited the palace to check on progress. The fountain in the middle of the courtyard, the centrepiece of the Chanel 2012 fashion show, was constructed to the king's approved design, one that was very symbolic of his position as ruler of all. On top of the 16-foot structure was placed the royal crown, pouring out water suggestive of the king's benevolence and his mastery over all mortal and supernatural life, depicted as all manner of human forms and faces, and also mythical creatures such as unicorns, winged deer, and a mermaid. One carving shows a character dressed in the recognisable gown and bonnet of a common beggar, a gaberlunzi man, perhaps representing James disguised as a peasant. The king was indeed sometimes referred to as the good man of Balangrich, after an area below Stirling Castle where he was wont to wander incognito. What might he have seen if he had wandered forth into the 16th century Linlithgow streets. In the Kirkgate, he would come across lots of little trading stalls, and at the cross, a market in full swing. Dealers would be crying their wares, cattle would be being killed and butchered in the street, and the meat products sold from two outlets actually underneath the market cross itself, a large circular structure topped by the heraldic Stuart unicorn. No doubt some dastardly felon would be in the pillory. I make no comment about Johnny Alls. In the centre of the cross was a simple dipping well fed with water through pipes which started in what is now Rosemount Park. Around it, local craftsmen would be selling their wares, all of them members of one of the towns in corporations or fraternities, the cordoners, tanners, walkers, dyers, wrights, Coopers, Baxters, Weavers, Tailors, Smiths, each guild presided over by a deacon. All had monopolies of their trade and jealously guarded methods of manufacture, quality and price. Dominating the cross was the townhouse, a 14th century building <coughs> which did not encroach into the Kirkgate as it was much smaller than the 17th century replacement. Coming out of this building, having paid their cess tax or their borough mails, were the Burgesses, the borough property owners, perhaps around 80 of them, out of a population of just over a thousand. Perhaps they had also been charged an additional payment, a stent maybe, levied to pay for the king's marriage or for his military expenses. In return, the Burgesses would be granted trading and civic privileges. The disguised monarch might also have bumped into some prominent locals like Bartholomew Kello, a town bailey and a lawyer, a man with a university degree which entitled him to be called Mr Kello, or perhaps wealthy property owner Henry Forrest, coming out of the tollbooth having completed the sale of his property in the High Street. His own residence was at 123 High Street, which was later sold the incorporation of shoemakers. In 1540, Henry Forrest was selected by the Burgesses to be Linlithgow's first provost, a word from the Latin pri positus, meaning placed in charge. King James was keen to give his royal boroughs more autonomy, in return, of course, for an annual payment and the requirement to provide armed soldiers. King James was not pleased at Linlithgow's appointment as it appeared that Provost Forrest had Protestant tendencies. 
and taking advantage of the trouble facing the Roman Catholic Church, he had acquired two acres of land from John Scott, prior of the Carmelite monastery. King James was displeased and appointed his own candidate, Robert Wotherspoon, as provost. Continuing eastward through his royal borough, James would have seen a chaotic huddle of simple dwellings, for there was no town planning as such. The road forded over the Bell's Burn, which was surrounded by a marshy area. Mud splashed up over the years on the end wall of a building there, earning that residence the nickname Durton Gables. A rural lane ran up to Barnes Hill, look at the spelling on the map, called after the monastic Tithe Burn, which stood there. And from there, the track led on to the wonderfully named Clock Sorrow Mill, named after the slowly revolving mill wheel. What James would undoubtedly experience would be the smell. Tanners scraped fresh, greasy skins, which were then soaked in pungent oak bark to release the tannin. The bones were handed over to the makers of knife handles, combs, dice, and even, we know, ice skates. And the process of burning that material was decidedly rank. Dyers use wood, saffron, burnt heather, and rotting onions to colour their cloth. Back in the palace, for a breath of fresh air, James might keep on his peasant disguise and dress his servant Rab Gibb as the king. On one occasion, Rab acted the part beautifully, hearing several petitioners all begging for some favour or other. Eventually, Rab stood up, took off the gown, declared that he was the truth, the, the servant of the king, and that all these scroungers wanted was for the king to grant them something while he alone loved his monarch out of nothing but stark love and kindness, a phrase which went into common usage in Scotland. Although busy with the affairs of state, James could also relax. His particular love in the company of Rab Gibb, his trusty master of the stables and the royal buckhounds, was to ride in search of game in the countryside around Linlithgow. James was also a fine musician and fine singer, and indeed, he composed music and lyrics, maybe not of great quality. Recht sere oppressed am I with pain, Baith nicht and day they still remain. O oh, hear my moan, dear Venus Queen, I loo that lady beauteous to be seen. But gif that she gies me near a meat, Then to my death I then shall quickly speed. Thank you. James also enjoyed the theatre and in 1540 was present in Linlithgow at the first ever performance of Sir David Lindsay's In Satire of the Three Estates. This poked fun at the foibles and moral lapses of the Catholic clergy. Some observers wondered if the king would uh, appreciate the mockery, but it would seem as if James was keen to make the church's problems well known in the hope that they would be amended. The last time the king rode up the Kirk Gate was in November 1541, when he stayed in the palace for a week with his very pregnant wife. Earlier in that year, he had lost his two sons, an event he was convinced had been predicted in a nightmare he had experienced. Fearing perhaps more catastrophes, he had reached out to Henry VIII and arranged a peace meeting in York. Henry arrived there with his fifth wife, Catherine Howard and waited for nine days. James did not show up, further angering the English monarch. Now that his sister Margaret, James V's mother, was dead, Henry saw no obstacle to him invading Scotland and teaching its Catholic king a lesson. In response to this English army mobilising, James summoned Wappenshaws, literally weapon shows. In Linlithgow, every able-bodied man aged 16 to 60 was ordered to muster on the Borough Muir, armed with a suitable weapon. They were to dress in protective padded jackets, studded with metal plates. They had to have leather gloves and gorgets or neck protectors. Only the nobility was allowed to bring horses for their own use. Any other animals in evidence would be requisitioned to haul supply wagons or cannon. The total Scottish force, numbering some 20,000 men, eventually congregated on the Borough Muir in Edinburgh, before marching south 
to face an English contingent which had been pillaging around the towns of Kelso and Roxburgh. The two opposing forces met at Solway Moss, just northeast of Gretna. The omens were not good. James, in a letter to his wife, admitted that he was ill and his two commanders, Lord Maxwell and Oliver Sinclair, had fallen out. Many of the Scottish troops spent their time stealing cattle and so were caught by surprise when the English, under the command of Sir William Musgrave, suddenly attacked and trapped the Scots between the River Esk and a peat bog. The result was a complete rout. Sinclair fled the battlefield, leaving behind hundreds of Scots warriors killed or drowned in the marshland. 1,200 were taken prisoner. The Scots lost all their artillery pieces, and to cap their disgrace, the royal standard fell into English hands. Humiliated, King James returned in shame to Linlithgow, where he bade farewell to his wife and secluded himself away in Falkland Palace in Fife. On the 9th December 1542, news reached him that his wife had given birth, not to the hope for son and heir, but a girl, allegedly giving rise to his remark, it can we alas, it'll gang we alas, allegedly, alluding to the fact that the Stuart dynasty had begun with Marjorie Bruce, daughter of King Robert, and that it would end with a female, and that would be his daughter, newly christened Mary, in St Michael's Church. One week later, James was dead. Broken-hearted, depressed, perhaps suffering from dysentery or maybe cholera, his body was borne through the streets of Edinburgh to his burial in a Holyrood Abbey next to Madeline and his two deceased infant children. He was the last Scottish monarch to die in Scotland and the last whose body was paraded through the streets until September 2022, when Queen Elizabeth passed away in Scotland at Balmoral, and whose corpse was driven through Edinburgh 480 years after King James V. Isn't history fascinating? Thank you all so much for listening.